but what's really happening is, um, is China has under construction, um, by 2030, they're going to add minimum a quarter of what's actually under construction permitted and, um, underway. And if any, everything plans gets undertaken, it's at a third and that that's absolutely absurd when you consider how big they are. So that that's adding more than the rest of the world's cons, um, coal consumption, just excluding India. It's a, it's just, um, it's my numbers point. are just, yeah, numbers are massive. Trader Ferg, how you doing? Great, Hank. It's lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you. It's uh, like I said off camera, it's uh, quite early in Atlanta, Georgia. So. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you getting up. Yeah, as I was saying before, yeah, I was up at I think 4.30 with my my one and a half year old with a fever. So yeah, you know, it sucks to be us. Yeah, too, too, too early. <laughs> yeah, very much too early. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, let's do, let's start with this is, um, as I just said, um, previously off camera, well, I really wanted to talk to you just about your perspective on energy and specifically coal. Give me a, a 30,000 foot view of why energy and why now, what made you interested in it? Certainly. So I guess a 30,000 foot view would be we're at a point where I think we're going to have another leg up in inflation. And there's going to be a, um, it's going to be a big rush for, um, for like value for real, um, intrinsic value, like assets that, um, are going to be hard to replace high replacement cost, whether that's, um, whether that's mines, whether that's rigs, whether that's tankers, whether like, I've just, um, looking for where I can buy assets that are hard to replace for cents on the dollar. In sort of an inflationary world, I think they will be um, valued highly, and they sort of been largely left for dead the last sort of decade. And so, sort of that's that's my like thousand foot view is um, is I think you only have to go through the numbers um, with a lot of the developed countries. The um, the debt's unsustainable. They're going to end up monetizing a lot of it. That's kind of the end game when you you figure there's there's really only three ways they can go about it. They've got, um, they can default, which why would you default when you can print, you can, um, push austerity, which no one ever likes to do in a democracy, always kind of end up voting for free money. And so it all roads lead to, um, sort of printing away. It's from almost what we saw in the thirties and forties. Like you just, um, you bring the debt to GDP back under control by, um, monetizing the debt and I think once you arrive at that conclusion then it's just a, a hunt for scarcity and what what's going to be valued the most like I've I've got this whole theory around um like it's kind of like the polar opposite of we had the network effect which has been like held up as the ultimate um sort of goal I think in this coming sort of coming decade it'll be we call it the embedded energy effect, like what's hard to replace in an energy scarce, high inflation world. And that's where I've kind of been hunting, like hunting in all the hated areas that's led me to coal, that's led me into the offshore um, services space. We have had companies that have just spent billions, um, building a whole lot of rigs, gone bankrupt, written off all that debt and still have all the assets on the balance sheet. Um, and yeah, that's. I guess that's my thousand foot view. That's how I come out the markets really and spend all my time in areas that most people like groan if you mention. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think of, you said in the pennies on the dollar, I think of this time right now, similar to, and I didn't, I lived through this, but not in the Soviet Union, but I, I see this as like similar to the fall of the Soviet Union when they had all the oligarchs made and they were just buying up assets or not buying up, but they controlled assets and owned assets. However, they got them for that. And they would, you know, I mean, everything fell, but they owned all the resources. 
And so I guess that's my best analogy or the way I think of it. Like I need to buy as many hard assets, whether that's energy or it could be a, a base metal even or a precious metal, but even a base metal, because if, if things fall or when things fall or whatever, um, that's where you want to be. You want to own those things. Um, talk to me about specifically then energy. Is it, is it primarily a monetary thing for you then? Is that what's gotten you interested or is it, is there a supply demand, um, mathematical calculus? In yeah. Yeah. So whenever I talk about, um, sort of the fed or anything like that, it's, that's it, just sort of a, um, this is the icing on top. I'm, I'm looking at all these things with the supply demand. That's what gets me in, in the first place. It's, um, the, the one that I was most attracted to, and it's still the majority of my portfolio is uranium, because that was the first where I could, I could map out the supply demand. It was the demand was noble, which I just found fascinating. I've never kind of come across it in all the investments I looked at. Like I could actually map out this. 450 odd uh, reactors um, globally and there's 60 under construction and you can kind of work out roughly how much they'll need moving forward. You can have a lower bound, you can assume some um, some additional restarts or something, but you can actually kind of arrive at a pretty, pretty precise figure and then you can work out how many pounds are being produced globally and you can say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't work. This and, is it just doesn't work. And it's, it's, it's kind of that simple. Whereas there's, there's been some, some massive mistakes with people that are, are super smart and yet they assume the demand side, like a classics kind of lithium, like you can, um, a lot of those demand numbers were based on like a, a huge sort of EV adoption and lithium ion being the winning battery chemistry. And I like question both of those narratives and it doesn't matter how good you were on the sort of the mining mass, finding the best resource, like you could have picked all of it and you still get smashed. And I kind of don't think I'm that smart. So I just want to make it as simple as possible to make sure that I've got a big margin of safety. Yeah. Just do the math. Um, well, let's talk about uranium. Is that something that has had a heck of a run for, uh, since the summer? And I was, I was, uh, talking to somebody just the other day about it. They waited. You might have known him, Chris, uh, Chris McIntosh. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. he's, um, I, yeah, no, um, he, so my mentor for the last 10 year, uh, 10 years runs a fund with Chris McIntosh. So the, the guy that completely awesome. showed me the ropes for the entire game, Brad McFadden, he's business partners with Chris. And so. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You kind of yeah. remind me of him. It's your demeanor. He's very calm. So, but. but <laughs> well, what's interesting though, he was long uranium, I want to say in 2016, 2017, and he waited, he just waited, he said, 16, 17 years. And yeah, did you have to wait a while? Because I mean, it's been such a tear recently. And so that's my question, Stu, Paul, did you, you, did you have to wait a while and are you still feeling the same way or see the same things in that trade? Yeah, so I had to wait a while. I was quite lucky in that I didn't have a lot of money at the time that he was first getting involved because also Brad, my mentor was getting involved in that sort of 16, 17, and I was still largely income trading because I'd quit my corporate job and was kind of needing to produce income sort of month out, a month in, month out, and had sort of a strategy around that. That strategy stopped working around 2019. Um, and so I had a lot of cash sitting around, which was quite fortunate when March, 2020 rolled around and I'd really built up my conviction on uranium. Came. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was just a huge stroke of luck for me. And that's, yeah, what I've kind of built the base of my portfolio on. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still bullish. Um, I often say like the asymmetry has gone. I don't think, um, I think there's better setups in other sectors of the energy trade. Like I, I haven't bought um, any uranium for, um, for years now. And, but that's not to say it hasn't got legs. I 
I kind of find it fascinating when I try and model out all the, um, all the mines, all their timelines and match that to the demand. It still feel, falls about a quarter short of it and miners are notoriously. Yeah. Yeah. I know. They're like, and, and, yeah. and this is like miners promises, which are <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, so not, yeah, yeah, not worth very much. Like we can already go down the list and I can just like strike off one after like kind of, um, off the top of my head, like global atomic, that's obviously going to be pushed back when they can't even get financing with what's going on in Nigeria. You've got, um, even like I saw next gen just came in three, 5% cost over run on their CapEx to probably be pushed back. Like it, it's the game. It's hard. Mining's a hard game and it all gets pushed back, takes longer. And there's also an assumption that there's just, um, there's the professional sitting on the sideline, ready to put all these projects to it. It's hard. Like if you, if you look at the last bull market of all the promises made of, um, developers bringing that into production, Paladin was the only developer that brought it in, uh, uranium mine into production without the help of a, a major or a JV with a major and yeah. like take over M M M A or a JV with a major. And so, yeah, when you look across all, all the developers, there's going to be a, a lot of, um, broken promises and, um, and pissed off investors. Yeah. But it seems like, uh, you, I don't want to say you moved on, but you looked at other places. Um, so let's, or are you looking at other places? Uh, let's talk about that. Um, I, I, I don't know how old the, uh, article was, but you wrote on your sub stack, how you were bullish oil. Is that s still the case? Is that something you're still looking at crude oil? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. No, I've, um, it's one of the areas I'm most bullish on at the moment. I still continue, um, buying small unloved companies, um, that are um, all around the offshore oil complex. I, I love that, um, that sort of offshore oil services, where it's OSVs, jackups, um, rigs, and also looking at all like the kind of the support industry. I want to find the little companies there that, um, that are highly cyclical, unloved and become lean and mean, often had recaps, bankruptcies. And I think they're well positioned for the future because like, I guess backing out with why I'm so bullish on oil, I just see demand continually grinding higher. It's like the, the IEA just forever is underestimating developing market growth. It's, um, it just has to revise its numbers every, it's, it's, it's literally a joke, a chart of revisions. They miss it by a million barrels, um, per day, every year and have to revise it. And then they do the same the next year. And that's yeah. just, um, that's just mostly India and China climbing the S curve. That's just, um, then trying to get, not even get close to what we're consuming in the developed world. Like if, if you break it down barrels per person, we're, um, develop what, or me saying this from the developing world, I'm in Indonesia, but. Um, for people in the developed world, consuming 12, 13 barrels per person per year and the developing world still sitting around three barrels per person per year. And so they're, they're just trying to, they're just trying to get up to that, um, four barrels per person per year that they're, they're just trying to increase their living standards. And so that, that alone adds 50% to the energy system by 2050. And that's before you stack on population growth, like demographics is, is, um, pretty robust trend and that's, that's adding another 2 billion people, which is another 50% to the, um, to the energy system. So I'm pretty confident in that long-term, um, demand growth. And then you come to the supply side and I just think shales, shales patched the gap. It's been down there. I think it's like 95% of the additional growth in the oil space over the last, um, last decade. And I think that can't, that can't provide the growth. And if anything, I think it will disappoint moving forward. And I think we're kind of starting to see, um, some of those signs, some of like the, the gassiness of some of the shale, the, um, the sort of the oil to NGL ratios really starting to, um, to drop off. So yeah, that's, that's my thousand or the high end, high view of oil. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because um, 
you have a lot of shale here in the U.S. or the North America, if you would. And I was reading recently that there's like a 50% depletion rate. Mm. <laughs> the shale. Yeah. So it's, there's a lot of it, but a lot of it's really, really fast. Mm. And uh, that can't be sustainable, a 50% depletion rate. Yeah. It sounds to me, though, that, that you're more interested, though, in... Um, the service, the service, oil service uh, industry or companies, that's how you're playing it as opposed to uh, uh, production. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, I like stuff I can wrap my head around and work out on sort of a table neck. And if I can, um, if I can go in there and work out what their assets or the replacement cost is and what I think I'm picking them up for, it gives me a nice big margin of safety. Um, I'll, I'll take that trade every day. I just don't, I don't think I'm smart enough to work out, um, some of like, if they start talking like sort of, um, like some of the, some of the production and potential production and they start spitting out the numbers. Like I, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't, um, so similar to uh, mining, don't tend to be sort of a geologist and I like to keep it as simple as possible and with, um, OSVs drill ships, um, semi-subs, I can, I can work all that out and give myself a big margin of safety. And also think offshore is going to be, um, where a lot of like the additional growth is going to have to come from is just with, um, with the, the shale boom, um, it just made so much more sense to, um, not only from sort of a return, like you get a, a quick return on, on your capital, you also didn't have to invest billions in long-term projects when supposedly we're getting off oil with the, the whole sort of the climate agenda, like, and I'll take the other side of that all day long. I think that's taking the other side of the, um, ESG climate agenda. That's going to be very profitable over the next decade. Got it. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. I want to get that in a second, uh, your methodology, um, because it seems like you're very, uh, again, it goes back to your very basic, simple, but you're also very calculated. Um, but before I go there, let's talk about coal. Um, why are you so interested in coal? And I'm going to have another analyst on, analyst is the wrong word, but he is an analyst and investor on next week. You might have, you might know him. His name is Matthew. He's here in the U.S. Yeah. Matt Water? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you should just ignore what I say about Cohen. Just ask him. He, he, he he's the man. Yeah, no, he's fantastic. I I follow him super closely, and yeah, respect respect his view immensely. Yeah, and it's a well, lovely guy as well. Mm. I I yeah, he is. Sounds like a great guy. I'll send you the link uh, uh, with my interview. I'd love but, that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, um, talk to me about Cole. Um, why are you interested in the? Uh, uh, and coal, uh, it's such an unloved asset and I would agree with you too. And I know very little about it, but I would say, I agree with you. I'm very interested in coal. And I guess to set this up is my, um, I talked to an, another guest I had on and it was, it was just, his position was how much of the world, specifically India and China use coal. And we don't really realize that it's such a cheap and viable, it needs to, it needs to be used for the vast part of the country. I mean, the world. So, but what's your, why are you interested in coal and why are you investing in coal? Yeah. So, um, I'm a massive coal bill and this is, I guess the high end view is like going back to how I described uranium, where the demand's knowable and the supply, um, there was just massive supply destruction. We've seen similar play out of coal, except the demand side, it's just, um, I call it like inconvenient demand or, um, or like demand or, that no one wants. Yeah. No, no, no one wants to, um, accept it. You, you see charts put up, which, uh, cherry picked and showing Western coal demand, like dropping off a cliff, like they often see the UK or the European and falling from top left to bottom right. But what's really happening is, um, is China has under construction, um, 
by 2030, they're going to add minimum a quarter of what's actually under construction, permitted and um, underway. And if any, everything plans gets undertaken, it's at a third. And that, that's absolutely absurd when you consider how big they are. So that, that's adding more than the rest of the world's cons um, coal consumption, just excluding India. It's a, it's just, um, it's my numbers point. are just, yeah, numbers are massive. And then you have India, which was, um, was supposedly going on a big renewable binge. Um, they held, I think it was the, um, it was the G20 and levels in Mumbai and they were, everyone was expecting them sort of to double down on the renewables and they turned around and they, they're, um, adding 25% to their coal fleet by 2030. And this is, um, this is, <laughs> both of them are just massively ramping. And this is because they, um, like I always love to quote the Indian energy minister and he's like, I will not, um, I will not, um, compromise on my growth and, uh, growth. Economic growth comes from energy. You, um, you can't do it with renewables. Everyone, everyone loves to point at, um, the sort of renewable percentage growth, but it, it's off such a low base. Like in China, it's, um, it's like sort of solar is one or 2%. And then there's also the trick of looking at capacity saying like 50% of, um, of capacity in China is now renewable mm. or, uh, or solar's capacity versus actual generation. I think it's got 20% capacity and only 3% generation, I believe. And so it's, um, it's, it's just smoke and mirrors really. And when you look at coal, coal still growing, um, and it's every year it's adding more than like all, all that solar can add off that low base when you're adding, you're growing off a sort of a 70% base. And so that's where all the demand is coming from. And Asia is doing the same. Because largely, um, Asia is not well suited to, um, to wind and solar. Inter interestingly enough, like there is, there's certainly, um, segments of it, but, um, all the demand profiles adding a lot of air conditioning and that, that you need, um, you need base load, you need, um, which wind and solar can't, can't add the, the battery storage isn't there. And so it, it's all going to come from coal. And then you, you back this out to the coal stocks, which you can buy like they're priced for death. Like if you're buying something at two, three times cash flow, that's kind of telling you that they're, they're terminal in three years. And, um, yeah. and I just love that. I, they're doing everything to, um, tail supply. Like, um, you only got to look at Australia. They're, um, trying to cut them off from finance. It's, um, make permitting tough, similar to the U S. Like you've got, you've got the likes of Bloomberg trying to shut down all the coal plants and yet I see all this demand, um, out. And so I see a very long runway with it. And the beautiful thing when you can buy something two, three times cash flow, and it's, um, going to have a long life and it's potentially going to buy back a lot of its stock. And this is where I've, like, I wrote a, a piece on it called, um, Moats and Cannibals. And this is just simply the idea. If you can, you can find a company that's got uh, a large economic moat that makes it hard to compete with. And a, like a clean example would be Peabody Energy that, um, had a ma massive acquisition, um, bought, dropped 5 billion on, um, a met coal mine and then went into bankruptcy in 2016, wrote off approximately 5 billion, um, and then popped out. Now it's got that asset producing cash flow. Um, moving forward, the standard way of thinking is, oh, but the market won't re-rate it. Well, doesn't matter. This is where the cannibal idea comes in. If they just pour that cash flow into cornering their own float. And this is what, um, Alpha, um, Met Resources has done as probably the leader in this. They've, um, brought back about a third of their float and we're seeing a few names that are, are just starting this. And for anyone that hasn't seen the, the um, chart, that's um, been about a hundred bagger. And I think there's another few of these names that <laughs> if, you, if, if you give them a long runway, maybe not a hundred, but, um, the, the current names, if you, um, give them a long enough runway, they'll produce some pretty spectacular returns. Yeah. That is awesome. Uh, interesting. Um, 
what other industries are, or is there any other uh, industries that you're looking at um, in the hard assets that uh, we haven't talked about? Yeah, certainly. So I've, I've been right down the rabbit hole with um, Platinum Group Met Metals lately. I, I really love that trade. Uh, that's reasonably recent. And I think that's just another big misconception by the markets. You, um, you can pull up Norse Nichols sort of investor presentation and they are saying that the palladium market's going to be sort of a negative 1% growth per year out to 2030 and platinum's going to be negative 2% growth out to 2030. And that's on the basis of this massive um, sort of electric vehicle adoption, which makes sense as they're a um, large nickel producer. But I think that's entirely wrong because um, the, the EV adoption is, um, is going to disappoint and it is disappointing now. And I think what you're actually seeing, if you go through the best selling vehicles in China and you actually look at BYD's production, it's actually plug-in hybrids. And the way plug-in hybrids work is with the, um, the engine being far more start stop, it actually needs more, a uh, larger catalytic, catalytic converter, some more, um, platinum, palladium and rhodium, which is a really interesting story in itself, rhodium, and it needs more to the tune of about 10 to 15%. And so you're, um, you're going to see the demand actually grow, not decline. And I don't think the market's prepared for this. You saw a whole lot of the material dumped on the market post the Russian invasion, and that's just absolutely created the price. It's taken the price below where um, a lot of the South Africa, where the the vast majority of all the production is taking it below that prices. So you've seen a whole lot of production um, cutbacks and mine, like mine's, um, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of cutbacks in the area, especially with North nickel, because a lot of it's byproduct. And so it's, um, it's extremely cheap. And so this is kind of like air pocket in the, um, in the, in the market. And so I'm a huge bull on that, especially when. It's, it's one of the most concentrated, um, materials like with tape rhodium, um, South Africa's produces about, I think it's somewhere in the, the mid eighties of global rhodium and rhodium's essential for these catalytic converters. Um, and so I, I just find it a fascinating trade, um, one that you can get into very cheaply. Now it's got the angle of being sort of a precious metal that you're buying at, um, at very cheap levels. And I think the, the future demands is um, completely wrong. Interesting. You know, uh, one of the things I, I was thinking about as you were talking is you, I don't know if this is on purpose or if it's mm. just the way it's working out is a lot of these commodities, if you would, that you're interested in are produced in, in unstable places or they're affected by conflict. Again, not that we wish conflict on anybody, but that is, we haven't even talked about that. Like if something were to happen, that would just constrain supply even more, if you would. Yeah. So, yeah, work that out for me. Is that going to your calculus or? It certainly does. Like we've, um, I've just gone through this with the, um, patenting group metal plays. I was trying to hedge myself by finding a way to buy. With rhodium, if you, I could have bought physical rhodium, I thought that would have been the perfect trade because you'd get the, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you'd get the, um, Who does that? get all the, <laughs> it's physical. It's <laughs> awesome. It's so awesome. Yeah. If you look at the chart, it's even more awesome. It's like a massive boom. And then it's just like flat line. Like it's absolutely like you've drawn a flat line with a ruler and that's, that's my favorite chart to see. And so I can get all the leverage with South African miners and then I could have hedged myself with physical rhodium. So, and in the case that the, yeah. Start yeah, putting so in, the shit outside, huh? Yeah, like try and put it in the safe. Yeah. And that's so awesome. Yeah. Huh. So that would, I guess, uh, uh, conflict does go into your equation again, um, just in your supply equation, then that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I, 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 I always talk about, cause I, I try and avoid conflict zones and I constantly get, um, go back in like a, it's a kind of a running 
running jokes with friends. I say, I'll sleep better when I'm out of um, African miners. And then I end up loving the value proposition and going and buying another African, <laughs> African miner every few months. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm back in there. So yeah, yeah. maybe, well, maybe it all goes wrong. Mm. Yeah. If you're compensated accordingly for your risk. Yeah. I mean, why not? So. Well, interesting. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time. Any, any, any parting thoughts as we're wrapping up here, any advice that you would give to our viewers and listeners? Uh, just Great. keep it simple, keep it simple and have a, have a strategy that you can stick with and that you can just stomach the volatility. I see a lot of mistakes being made by trying to avoid volatility. Um, when, when you have conviction, um, volatility is your friend gives you a chance to get in cheaper. And so then the only way you really get conviction is doing the work and understanding that, um, volatility isn't risk. It's just, um, it's just, it's just an opportunity. If you can, um, if you can size stuff, right. Like this comes into position sizing, which is super important. I've often said the position size is a stop loss. So there's a whole lot of unknowable risk that I'll never be able to fully account for. And so I account for it with a position size. I'm very strict with my position sizing. I almost never go above 5%. Um, and, um, I kind of take care of it. Yeah. With strict position sizing. Um, I don't know how people run like big, like 20, 30% positions. That's, that would, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. My, my average position size is two to 3%. Yeah. Interesting. Well, again, I want to thank you so much for your time. How do people uh, follow you? How do they, if they want to be in touch with you and, uh, yeah, learn more, um, about you and what you're doing. How do they do that? Uh, so to find my sub stacks, pretty much where all my work is now. Um, it's traderferg at substack.com um, is definitely where I'm the most active these days. I will link to it in the show notes, both on the YouTube channel and in the podcast. Uh, Trader Ferg, I want to, you're very gracious and you're very knowledgeable. I just want to thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Really enjoyed it. You got it.